I was pretty nervous on the weekend that I wasn't going to be able to make it today because my voice was going to be lost. I was at the Arsenal game, but I can say that we beat the old enemy. As you know, my name is Simeon, and if, like me, you were a child in the 1990s, then without question, I know that your Saturday mornings were absolutely brilliant if you had a working TV. Because the 90s was a brilliant era for children's television. Children's television was at its absolute prime. And my favorite was Saturday mornings. BBC One, live and kicking. <laughs> now, there are three things that 90s babies and children in the 90s must remember about live and kicking. The first one is a telephone number. 0181811-8181. It is impossible to forget that number. The second one is when Andy Peters, the presenter, left the show and probably was the most emotional moment in the history of children's television when he went off in tears, crying, saying, Emma, Emma, you're the best. And she was like, no, no, you're the best, Andy. <laughs> Some people cried at Bambi, but I found that pretty emotional. Third thing, and probably most importantly for me, was the comic book cartoons. Now, the 90s saw a wave of DC and Marvel comics reinvented into an animated series. And for me, who didn't have Fox kids at the time, Saturday morning, that was my opportunity to watch Spider-Man and X-Men and Batman and the work of DC and Marvel. Now, to all of us who were introduced to comic books and cartoons, we were also introduced to comic book justice. And we would have learned the first time what seems to be a normal rule of life, which is that if you try to rob a bank like the Joker, take over the city like the Kingpin, or take over the world like Lex Luthor, then you are going to prison. Because prison is for the thief, prison is for the supervillain, prison is for the bad guys of our story. The trouble is, is that although cartoons these days are slightly more nuanced than a lot of our journalism, they still fail to capture the complexity of what is justice. What is it that makes justice justice? And our prisons are not merely filled to the brim of bad guys, whatever they are, but young people. Young people like Alex. Alex was an East Ender. He's from the East End, born in Tower Hamlets, neighboring to the borough where I was born in Hackney. At the age of six, he was taken into care after being repeatedly raped by a family member, a trauma that would affect him throughout his childhood. And then, after being regularly excluded from school, he was finally kicked out in 2010 after being diagnosed with ADHD. He began committing offenses, including robbery. And after doing tag and community sentences, Yacht, Tower Hamlet's Yacht, referred him to youth offending prison Cook and Wood. At Cook and Wood, he began self-harming, and he cut himself with whatever he could find. And then one day, he disclosed to an officer about his childhood. And then he went back to his room, and he closed the door, and he removed the laces from his shoes, and he put them around his neck, and removed the life from his body. He was pronounced dead. He was 15 years old. We rarely ask the question, just who are the bad guys in Britain's jails? Who are the bad guys in Britain's jails? According to the MOJ's figures, 1,346 of these are children. 50% of under 25s in prison have been in the care system at some point in their life. 70%, some reports say, have two or more mental disorders. So care leavers, children, and the mentally ill, are these the people who should be rotting in Britain's prisons? If any story highlights the travesty of our prison system and its allergies, but his story is far from isolated and echoes the suicides of Rulliwani Balogun, of Joseph Scholes, of Ryan Clark, of 18-year-old Sarah in Style Women's Prisons. And the murders or the suicides of these young people really raises three questions. Is this what justice should look like in modern Britain? 
Is jail ever a place for young people and children? And are children really the bad guys we want to send to jail? Now, as our government begins to flirt with committing millions upon millions into expanding the contracts of private companies to run our prisons, surely there is no better time to rethink not only what prison is, but also a new way to think and do justice. Surely there is no greater time to have the debate on what is justice and what should it look like, because right now it is flawed. A fundamental principle of our justice system is that of proportionate punishment. <coughs> punishment is at the heart of our system. And that comes a lot of the time from our anger. And victims have a right to feel anger, but is an anger that leads to the incarceration of children, often with little or nothing, that can perpetuate the injustices that led them to offend, is that really a form of justice or one that we believe in? Surely justice in its most purest form should be about the pursuit of anything first, then it should be about the pursuit of peacemaking or healing or a level of restoration long before we discuss punishment. Surely we should be looking at harm reduction and looking at how we can identify in situations where a crime has taken place, how we can try and rectify that situation long before we talk about punishment, talking about ways of reconciliation. For example, a burglary can make you feel unsafe in your own house. Surely the question that then follows is, how can that victim feel safe in their own house? How can the burglar understand that their greatest crime was not the theft itself. Surely reconciliation should be the place we start rather than hang them, flog them. How much time should they do? Surely we need a system that tries to create safe spaces for reconciliation to take place. Courtrooms are very combative spaces for decisions, not reconciliation. Prisons with their violence and their silences are far from it. Safe spaces where there can be that reconciliation matter. On a project called You Are Boss, that is at the Howard Lee for penal reform, a young man who did a restorative justice project wanted to discuss and wanted to put his voice out and how it had affected him. And I have his words. I thought my victim would be a bit pissed off for a couple of days or that what I did affected him for a week or maybe a month. But when I met him, it was still affecting him two years later. It affected him in his job and when he was going out. It's such a shock when you think you know something, but you know nothing. The meeting was a really big point in my life because it helped me to make the big changes I needed to make. At the end, my victim shook my hand and said, I hope everything goes well. It wasn't what I expected. I thought, how can he want things to go well for me when I didn't want that for him when I did what I did to him? It changed how I thought about the whole thing. I wouldn't think of committing any offenses because I've changed and that restorative justice meeting was part of that change. Justice surely is a process rather than a decision that pursues peacemaking before punishment, and that essentially is what restorative justice is about. Victims routinely feel mishandled by the court or isolated by the police, but according to the MOJ's figures, 85% were satisfied with the process of reconciliation through restorative justice. 85%. Now, of course, we live in a penal society, and so dramatically reforming the way that we do penal policy will raise difficulties. There are questions around the fact that restorative justice works via volunteered consent. And therefore, legislation cannot force that and make that happen, which creates a dilemma for policymakers. Secondly, how do you ensure that those who do the process don't reoffend? In many cases, what is necessary for people to go through the process is the need to feel convicted 
um, to want to be held to account. Now, in the case of cases of men who abuse women, they regularly feel guilt but then go on to reoffend. That creates another question mark. And finally, you always perhaps need a small model of incarceration for people that are dangerous to themselves and others. However, reframing what it is that justice actually is and having the pursuit of peace and reconciliation and trying to do harm reduction at the heart of your justice system rather than punishment completely changes the way that our institutions work. And one example of this is in the fact that secure children's homes for incarcerated children are a much safer alternative. Secure children's homes are small, locally run units in which that have high ratios of specialist staff who provide educational, behavioral, and therapeutic support. A Howard League investigation found that people felt far safer than they did in YOIs, which are youth prisons, which are known for their violence. The fact that secure children's homes have an ethos in which they see children who are incarcerated as children first before offended and have an aim to work with them and not necessarily first punish them shows you that when you have a different goal, things work somewhat differently. The danger now is, of course, that the current consensus is for warehousing of people and to use prison as a way of warehousing society's problems. And so each year, even more of these homes are being closed down. And this creates a question mark for us as a society. As somebody who has walked along the wings of some of the most notorious presence for young people in this country, it evokes more sense of tragedy than anything else. Watching young men struggling in their skin, caged in, under the expectations of what it even means to be a young man, can't be vulnerable, Men are taught to dominate. Men can't be even poor because men provide. Men don't cry. And the tragedy of it is a real indictment of the way that we choose to do justice of people who in many cases have nothing. Surely prison is not a place for the victim who prefers life as a bully than the bullied or for somebody who had to take care of himself feed himself, clothe himself since a wife, since a small child, and chose to take the only job that was available to somebody about letters beside their name on an estate with no jobs. And so right now, as we are in a period where the government is poised to commit funds into that system, there's a chance to rethink that. You know, we've seen today, we've heard how far we are in the digital age, creating digital space. We've seen toilets that don't even need water to flush them. But yet in this age, we still have to come back to old discussions on what is justice. We exalt our modernity, yet at the same time, there are many children who are incarcerated. And it's time to rethink that. See, prison may be for Lex Luthor, prison may be for the Kingpin, prison may be for the Green Goblin, but prison is no place for children. Thank you.